Welcome back to TechSnap. It's our second episode, and my name is Chris. Joining me is Alan. He's on the other line. But first, let me tell you a little bit about what TechSnap is. TechSnap is a show where we take some of the most interesting tech stories or tech topics out there, and we really give a critical analysis. We look into it and hope that you walk away from this show maybe learning a little something new. And the man with the plan, the guy that makes all of that possible, is Alan. Hey there, Alan. Welcome back. Hey, Chris. My, it's my cohort and geekiness there. Alan is, uh, for those of you new to the show, Alan is the vice president of a system called Scale Engine. It's a pretty neat server and hardware technology that lets sites scale up and down on demand. Jupyter Broadcasting runs there. Many other we- popular websites run there. And plus, he's got years of IT experience and just all kinds of tech topics. Uh, Alan, it's great to have you back, man. The second episode. We did it. Yeah. It's great. It was nice to see all the feedback people were sending. And yeah. uh, our Facebook page got a bunch. Uh, yep. We have a poll up there about the name. Some people weren't sure. They liked the name TechSnap. So there's a poll if you think you can come up with a better name. And people will vote on that. And we'll see what happens there. Yeah, and it's... Chris put up the links for all of our RSS feeds. Yeah. Yeah. So if you go over to the show notes, we'll have all of the RSS feeds up there now. You can get it in uh, pretty much every format for any device or in iTunes. Um, and yeah. The, uh, you know, I think right now we're keeping the name TechSnap. I, we yeah. realize that it kind of implies sort of a short show, and this show kind of has a long format, kind of a long yeah. discussion format. The other piece of feedback we got is some, for some players on some sites and some downloads, there's a video sync issue where the mouths don't match with the video, and we are working on that. It seems to be related to the length of the recording, since this is a long conversational discussion type thing. It might be this show might be the most susceptible to it, along with the Linux Action Show. But we're working on a fix. We're actually shooting in a new frame rate today. We're not. We have no idea if it's going to fix it or not. But we'll see. I doubt it. I doubt it because, unfortunately, regardless of what my camera is set at, the interface on this computer just assumes that it's a uh, interlaced 60i feet. So there's some technical limitations we have on our end. But Alan, we have got a heck of a show today. I think probably the biggest story that's been breaking over the last uh, few hours, I mean, we're shooting this on a, on a Thursday live at yep. uh, 1 p.m. Pacific. You're always welcome to join us. And mm-hmm. uh, probably the hottest story that's now bleeding into mainstream news and all of this is the uh, iOS 4 that can not only uh, do some pretty interesting background tracking, but saves it to a fairly standard, uh, readable SQLite database file and on top of that, not only is that on the phone where it's secured to root only, but it gets copied over to I, by iTunes for backups where it is read, it's readable by uh, anyone with user permissions on that machine. And uh, if you open that sucker up, it's, it's basically been tracking everywhere you go for as long as you've had an iOS 4 device. Yeah. And pretty pretty mind-blowing at first. Yeah. Because we talked about some of the things that we thought might be a reason to have some of that. Like uh, you were saying that using a database like that so that you could cache the geographic information yeah. so that the phone didn't have to power up the GPS and wait for a signal right. and iOS, it takes a while to lock on. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, iOS offers as like an API call for application developers a background location service. So you can have like a to-do reminders application that says, when I get home, remind me to take out the garbage, Right. And it, in, in order to enable that without killing your battery by having the app hit the uh, GPS all the time, Apple has the operating system track where you're at, and then the application simply requests that information via the API, and the phone just supplies it. So it's able to do the sort of in-the-background location checking, and uh, what Apple does to reduce battery power for that process is instead of using the GPS, they use cell phone triangulation uh, because it's rudimentary it's 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 crude but it tends to be accurate enough and so what apple does is they say all right you can have this background location service but it's only going to be available in a rough region you know we're not going to be able to say you can set location to 20 meters you know it's just going to be this general area and so in order to uh, make that accessible to application developers you have to put it in a in a way that doesn't take a computer scientist to read you know just want, people just want to bang out an app um and and that's where we think we've been led to as, at this point, but the details are right. kind of disturbing. Right, because the reason they have the assistant GPS is regular GPS doesn't work very well indoors and so on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so they cache this information in a database to make it easy to access. And yeah. That'll make sense. But why it keeps a history doesn't make sense. You know, uh, an indefinite history. I, I, could see, right. I could see a 
timeline that is, you know, within maybe a certain range that maybe apps want for like, a, you know, take, for example, a jogging application that wants right, to, or, you know, track your progress or something. I don't know. Yeah, and that makes sense. But the app could track it itself, right? As it does the API calls, it could store yeah. it itself. And it, yeah, yeah. Uh, a history lets you determine what direction people are traveling and things like that. Well, the 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 app can't necessarily tell on its own because the uh, the way Apple's multitasking works is the app isn't able to wake up oh, and request right. that. You know, so it has to it has to be able to read that information upon reloading. I forgot it wasn't real multitasking. Right, right. So this might be a hokey workaround for that for an application that's supposed to have been aware. Like, uh, like I, you know, Google recently uh, released uh, Google uh, Latitude for the iOS. And on, on Android, Google Latitude literally is a background daemon service that checks in from time to time. And on iOS, there's, that's not allowed. So I always wondered, how can Google, because the whole point of Latitude is real-time, well, not real-time, but aggregate tracking. So everywhere you yeah. go, Latitude tracks it. And then yeah, because I have that on my Windows phone, but it's only when the app's open. The app can run in the background, but right. I don't run it all the time because on Android, GPS you, will kill the battery. On Android, you check a box in the Maps app, and it's always doing it. Um, on iOS, you install the app, and all of a sudden, it can start doing it. And it seems like that must be enabled by this history in the SQL file. Right, but it, it seems to me that the history should be trimmed at some point. Whether oh, that's yeah. oh, an yeah. hour or a week even. Maybe that's too long, and maybe that should be a user setting. I can choose how long I want it to keep this data for me. Absolutely. Or so I, that if, if, if I'm not using Google Latitude and I don't want this information stored, I can just say no. But if I do, I can say keep it. So I don't have an iPhone, but I do have a 3G iPad. And uh, I took a stab and lo downloaded this open source software that... Uh, you can the downloads that extracts this the SQL database out of your backup and then uh, plots it, and so I did it. And we're not looking at my map here. I'm just showing you some screenshots. But, I was gonna uh, say. but sure You'd be enough, close to me there, honestly. Sure enough, uh, it's pretty boring where I've been, but my iPad knows, and uh, this application. That's kind of creepy. Honestly. It's, uh, you know, Alan. For me, it's not because yeah. Well, I, for me personally, if you looked at everywhere I've been in the last month, it would be very boring. Yeah, like, there's that. Work, homework, homework, data center, homework, homework. <laughs> yeah, there's absolutely mine's super boring. But um, mm. also, I as soon as I bought a device that had an always-on data connection with a GPS chip in it, I just immediately assumed I'm giving up my rights. Right. It's just too much power for a corporate entity not to abuse. And I'm not saying Apple's abusing it here, uh, but I, I think they're definitely outside the lines. Right. So uh, that was one of my questions is who else can read this data? So when it gets backed up and any computer on my or any program on my computer can read it, but who can request it from my iPhone? Root. So right. My, but some application could somehow get access to that if you're jailbroken or, if you're jailbroken yeah. definitely and the, and the well, issue with being jailbroken is by default if apple iPhone, wanted no. if apple wanted to know they are obviously going to be able to read the file because oh yeah there. oh yeah and so that brought up the question to me is is could your phone be subpoenaed to witness against you saying you were in this location at this time well, we do know, um, uh, we do know very, uh, very clearly, in fact, uh, so this is an interesting story that's in the show notes, and this is, is the most eye-opening thing about it, is this guy is a digital forensics expert who does uh, digital forensics for legal cases. He actually wrote about this back in, like, September. I mean, this, this guy has known about this for a very long time, and uh, he, he, goes on, he goes on to talk. Deal now. He goes on to talk about how forensics guys are already doing this, but the reality is, in fact, he even he released a book where he he's actually already. This is really interesting. In fact, he included a, a a picture of his book where he writes about this, and he writes in his book that came out in September, consolidated consolidated .db, and he gives you the path slash library slash caches slash location d slash consolidated .db. It's potentially one of the most forensically rich files an analyst can use. To view the data, open a terminal window and navigate to the directory that contains consolidated db using the, and it gives you the Unix commands to do it on, on the Mac. Uh, he says, a prompt for SQLite will appear if you type dot tables, you'll see the following output. And then it gives the output. So you can actually, you, you don't even need to install an application to read that database file. You can just do it right. in terminal. Now, yeah, because 
S light is already on there because that's what's used to write it. This guy, it this guy does use it for forensics, but here's my question. If you look at that map, it's, mm-hmm. it's all over the place in terms of where it, like it showed me in places I've never been. And on the video version, I'm giving a, a, a visual of it now. Yeah, you can see the, the different colors, I think, are how granular the data is. Yeah, how so much the yellow been ones are, are nice GPS fixes. The orange and red ones are ones where the GPS uh, wasn't very tight, right? It only had a couple of satellites. And then the giant blue ones seem to be the assisted GPS, meaning you were somewhere inside the circle. And uh, that's a huge range, A. And that one is huge, yeah. Also, one of the other things is you can look at it like mine. It showed me like up in the mountains on occasion. Uh, I've heard of other people being put in like uh, on different ends of the state lines and things like that because... Because that triangulation comes from the cell phone tower, if you pick up a stray signal, perhaps, yep. you know, it might register you as in a different location. Right. So I would think in a court of law, back to your original question, I would think in a court of law, it might not be um, concrete enough evidence. Maybe if you, if you could use a bunch of correlated data that shows an, a trend, you know, mm-hmm. a, a provable trend, then maybe something would be there. But, but the, the thing is, especially with court, is that they don't always understand the flaws of technology and they'll accept stuff that True. isn't necessarily good enough. And this brings up a related story that we were going to talk about. Um, so people have come up with a technique to do involuntary geolocation. What's where that? You, uh, instead of having to ask you for your geolocation from the GPS chip on your phone, they use your IP address to oh, find sure. out. Sure, you've right. been seeing so this on web ads tracking, for a couple of years yeah, now. Yeah, but tracking by IP address has been around for a long time, but it's not that accurate. Usually it's just based on the home office of the ISP or something, or the city name and the, the reverse DNS. But what this one does is it, it narrows you down to a circle based on that, but then it uses trace routes from multiple locations and see which routers it goes through to get to you. Brilliant. And some of those routers, it knows the location, right? Because... It's usually actually in the reverse DS name of the thing, right? So it says, you know, this is Comcast router in Virginia at this data center or whatever. Right. And so they know where that is. And then they measure the latency from there to you. And then by triangulating that from a couple of different source locations to where you are, they can get a basic idea of how far you must be from that known location. You you know, that's the interesting thing about that is I've done something semi-similar. I was in... I was in an environment just a couple of weeks ago where they had uh, dual failover firewalls, and we didn't have an immediate way to, to directly determine a which, because bo- they're both a DSL connection, but we couldn't directly immediately determine which connection we were on, because uh, the IPs change and they're dynamic, and so we you know, can't really tell by that. But I, from a previous test, had known that they took different paths out. And so I sort of am able to sometimes isolate down which connection they're using just by following the trace route output. Uh, right, which is see, kind of you know, which routers or ISP it goes through. And then, you know, another thing is uh, when, I, when I was contracting at a school district for a while, I, uh, I had like some seminars with, ch- with kids to show them around the technology rooms and all those kinds of things. And we always gave them a demonstration of trace route and towards the end of mm-hmm. it. And the reason we did it is we just said, just so you know, because we want to make sure that the kids growing up a no, because t- they have access to the internet sometimes before they fully understand the repercussions of putting everything on there and how trackable mm-hmm. everything is. So I just said, just so you know, all of these points here on this list, someone could potentially be plugged in and monitoring the traffic that you route through there. So always be sure you're using HTTPS, you know, when you're out and about and things, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So people mm-hmm. are really sometimes have their eye open just by running that trace route tool. It's kind of an interesting yeah. thing. And, and seeing what it's going through, and especially if you're using somebody else's Wi-Fi and so on. Yeah. I, I just wanted to circle back just real quick. I don't mean to mm-hmm. disorient everyone, but back to this article, uh, the guy that is the forensics analysis guy. Yep. Uh, he mentioned that he has uh, stuck traffic sniffers on both his Mac and his iPhone for extended periods of time and has never seen evidence that this consolidated DB has ever transmitted from the Mac or from the device. So right. that is interesting. Um, so maybe it's not used yet, but it could be. It could be. Well, and if you get physical access to the device, it's, it's absolutely right. possible. But Either device, unless you're encrypting your iTunes backup. Apple could decide that they want that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and Apple, what I think, we, what, here's my prediction. Apple said, we want to implement some of these things that Android could do, but we don't want to suffer the battery costs. So we need mm-hmm. people to be able to track their location. 
and I don't mean to rip on Apple when I say this, but sometimes Apple sucks at software. And I know that seems like a really strange thing to see, to say, but if you think about it, honestly, iTunes for Windows is balls. Um, there's a quick time for Windows has been balls for 10 years. QuickTime's been balls for forever. I mean, they're just not good at software in a lot of cases. And I bet they yeah. rushed to implement some sort of background-like location feature. They implemented a great SQLite database, patted themselves on the back for coming up with a super slick standard way to do it. And then they never took the time or the effort to write the cleanup code. They simply wrote the yep. code to write the information to the database, and they never wrote the logic code to go back and clean it up after a while. And I bet right. now that this is all over the news, you can guarantee Steve Jobs is on the phone to the iOS development head saying iOS is coming out next Tuesday with the update that fixes this click. And that's my suspicion is that Apple just being rushed and lazy ish. Well, caused this it, issue, but it's there and it's being abused. I mean, it's being abused. They by might not have ever intended to go back. Right. And it's like, well, it's a little SQL database storing a year worth of somebody's tracking history is not going to take up enough space to bother cleaning it up. They didn't consider the other repercussions. It's also very handy diagnostic information. You know, you yep. bring, somebody brings their iPhone in and says it hasn't been working very well. They could pull that, see if it correlates with other people who are reporting the same issues. It's like, oh, or it's like, oh, you said it stopped working when you were at the beach. I wonder if you got it wet. <laughs> oh, wouldn't that be funny? Honestly, mm -hmm. they got to fix this. They got to fix this yeah. fast, and they need to come out with a statement that explains themselves. And I think the easiest way to solve this is a preference. Yeah. There where I can say, I want it to last a long time because I want all these great features you get from that. Or yeah. I can say, I don't want it to last more than an hour because I only want myself to have access to this. We had a lot of people comment on the password hashing and the Super Gen Pass site and things like that. I think that would be a good moment. I think we've, I think we've probably said all we can say about the uh, iOS thing at this point. We, just, we have to wait for more information. Do you want to, do you want to circle back to the... Uh, password hashing topic and always salting your yeah. passwords, things like that? Yeah, uh, well, this came up because uh, there's a new data retention law being yeah. proposed in France. This is really something. That would something. force uh, all websites to keep the name, address, telephone number, and the plain text password of its users. And this would affect e-commerce sites, uh, web mail providers, and online video hosts. All websites. All websites? Not all websites, but most. Like all e-commerce e sites... Uh, webmail and online video hosts. Yeah, it's specifically, yeah, e-commerce sites, it says here. Yeah, yeah, and the webmail, oh. it seems. But basically, they want to be able to subpoena Google for access to your Gmail account or to subpoena Daily Motion to be like, well, who uploaded this pirated video? And they want things like your phone number. Google doesn't have my phone number right now, and I don't want to have to give it to them. They have mine because they have Google Voice. Right, but... And then the online video host one doesn't really make any sense. Yeah, uh, that's interesting. And I wonder if that's for a pornography thing or what, but... I don't odd. know. I mean, but, so that would, that, would, uh, that would technically apply to us. Mm -hmm. And it's really ridiculous. Like, making people store the plain text password is a huge security issue. Yeah. Right? Passwords are hashed for a reason. So that if something happens, like they get broken into, like what happened at Gawker, then it as at least some amount of work before the hacker can get everybody's password, right? With the Gawker one, they mostly got passwords that people had that were shortish, right? If you had like a 16 character password, they probably didn't get it very easily from the Gawker database. The main issue if, I have, oh, go ahead, sorry. Go ahead. Well, I, I just, I, I take, I mean, I, you, I appreciate, you know, you're, you're mentioning, I mean, storing in plain text is, is absolutely a ridiculous point, so I didn't mean to step on that. Mm -hmm. That is stupid but i guess the reason the re my first reaction to all of this is the whole philosophy of retaining all of this information is flawed to begin with i I don't, I don't even i i guess i have issue with the fact that it's in plain text but before we get to that point i'm like why are we even saving it in the first place why can the government force us to have to retain this information first of all and then as the operator i now have to facilitate the storage of this information and if you're a successful website that could be an f ton to figure out how to keep and manage and track and then how to get it to them Right, that, that's the worst part, is that through the passage of this law, the onus for storing all of this information and warehousing it and keeping it safe, especially since law enforcement, uh, the government wants you to keep it for like five years or something ridiculous, all that cost is just put on the providers of these websites. Well, and, and the onus is going to be on me to protect those passwords because they're in plain right. text. Whatever, however I store them is going to have to be secure. You know, if that's exactly. going to be an encrypted volume of its, uh, something, I mean, it's just, it's, a, it's not practical. It's, 
it's not practical. And the people that came up with this law obviously have no idea how the internet works or how cryptography works. Or, you know, they obviously don't understand why passwords are hashed in the first place. Right. right. The only way to make sure the database is secure is if the database doesn't know what your password is, but has some deterministic way of figuring out what your password, to figure out if the password you're entering matches. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And in the show notes, I included a bunch of links uh, that I've written about how password hashing works and how having unsalted hashes are, is a bad thing. And on and on about passwords. And like we always say, Alan, we're not doctors, but we always recommend you salt your passwords. Actually, <laughs> definitely check out the links in the show notes. They're, they're, they're pretty great. Um, and I'd like to hear everyone's opinion out there on what they think. If, if it does, the, I, I got to believe most of you would think in, the, in this case that the government probably doesn't even ha- need to have any access to this, to these information in these files. Well, no, it's, it's uh, a similar law was proposed in Canada in 2006 or so, yeah. but it got shot down because the ISPs said, we're not paying for that. Couldn't and they, people c- said, we don't want you to know that. What about the, what about the classic example of child pornography? You do want to be able to track that, and you do want to be able to stop that. So where do you draw so the line? So to, to stop that, you want to record everything every person does on the entire internet. That's forever. the flaw, right? And then it's just yeah. they, they go overboard, right? And, so. you know, those people are probably going to go through Tor or something, and there's nothing you can do about it. Well, chat, uh, comments, leave us a comment or in, chat, in the chat room. Like, really, the, the best way to track that down is financial transactions and yeah. and things that aren't specific to the yeah. internet. Yeah, there you go. There you right? go. I it's like a, that. It's a law enforcement problem, not an internet problem. Yeah. yeah. Luckily, uh, a number of companies are uh, filing suit in French court to try to block this law, including Google, Facebook, uh, eBay, Daily Motion, and a whole other list of brands. Yeah, that is good. Because Google doesn't want to have to deal with this. And hopefully... It's just some engineer at Google Could objects to making people store anything in plain text. Could you imagine what Google would have to, the, 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 the infrastructure Google would have to build out to store all that level of detail about uh, the, all the users of Google? Or at least yeah. all, even, and, even just the ones that have some sort of monetary transaction. I mean, that yeah, even, and it's just nonsensical. Let's, do, you, uh, do you want to move on to this next topic, the uh, Amazon the EEC2 outage yes. today? All right, let's talk about that. I this. think so, because that, that's the other big thing that was in the news today, is that yeah. uh, reality reigned on the Amazon cloud. Well, and it rains on Amazon's cloud today, yeah. It's, it's definitely mm-hmm. been a bad one. So people like Reddit and Foursquare and uh, a bunch of other websites like Hootsuite and all those others were just completely offline yeah, today. even a couple of uh, URL shorteners. Yeah. And it's been going on for more than 12 hours at this point. Amazon has, of course, their, uh, their whole uh, Amazon Web Services back in the cloud front and S3. And, and the outage that happened particular today is with their EC2 service. And that's but, the... S- uh, it's more specific. Um, it's the elastic block storage, the EBS, where... The back end storage drives, for EC2. Yeah, the, uh, are stored. But it's affecting EC2, EBS, and the uh, relational database, which is their little MySQL oh. hosting thing that's new. Yeah, yeah, it's and like an on-demand scale-up as you need to SQL data. only affecting the servers at the U.S. East 1 data center. That's still so, a ton of sites. But that's the cheapest one. It, you, it, there's a premium if you want to be in California. To charge oh, more money. really? Oh, yeah. okay, okay. So and, the cheap data but, center went down. <laughs> yeah, uh, but the, the way that the Amazon works is what they have these things called availability zones. And what they do is they kind of break up the data center into like isolated bits and so the storage is supposed to exist across a whole bunch of these. So if one of them goes down, it doesn't hurt anything. And right. apparently uh, there was some issues with network connectivity and it decided a bunch of stuff was down and it tried mirroring it to more availability zones until it basically collapsed the system with under the load of trying to mirror everything to everywhere. Now the uh, interesting and they thing, ran out of storage. The interesting thing about this is it just ended up literally bringing some huge sites offline. And of yeah. course, when you're reliant on this kind of system, that's a pretty big deal. Uh, uh, the the reaction from some of these companies, like um, boy, let's just take Hootsuite, Hootsuite for example. Here, they actually were pretty cool about the whole thing. They're like, look, uh, yeah, it sucks. EC2 is down, but uh, we we really we really think that EC2 is responsible for the fact that we even have been able to scale the way we have. Right. Um, so. 
I don't know. And so what I was saying is that if, if your app is mission critical, that maybe you need to consider having it span across more than one cloud. Yes. So that if one cloud breaks, you still have something else. How do right? you facilitate something like that, though? I mean, you'd well, almost need to have like a... A lot of the clouds have some kind of lock-in where they're custom and specific enough so that you can't easily move from one to another. Right. If you like uh, use the Amazon database format, you 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 sort of have to build your SQL for that in a way. I mean, right. It's not really all that portable. Right. That's why uh, there's a project from Rackspace and Pier One called, uh, and Dell called the OpenStack, and it's a open source uh, standardized way of doing uh, EC2, S3, and one other part of the Amazon Web Services, and this would mean you could either deploy it yourself or find a provider that uses this system and then find two of them, basically. Ah, yeah, that would be, that but, would definitely be one way to sort of mitigate the risk. But then if the problem happens to be an OpenStack software or something, then maybe you could be affected at both places. So <laughs> That's exactly it. You now almost you have, a single point. To have two completely separate clouds. Hmm. Or at least some kind of failover to handle things a little gracefully, like Reddit maybe could have had some caching servers that would at least show old data on the site. You know, from, from down. what I understand from the Reddit's been up and down a lot lately. And from what I understand, it's been uh, in a large part due to EC2 database issues. So yeah. I think Reddit struggled a lot because of that. And um, now we're, because, we're curious. You know, I want to yeah. ask you a question, though. Uh, mm -hmm. If... Do you think that possibly the whole, the whole utilization of only cloud hosting is flawed to begin with? Do people need to I do more so. like a, a, a scaled back mini infrastructure that is like their core day-to-day -day operation with, with, with scaling into the cloud? Yeah, I think uh, it's important to have at least have some of your infrastructure somewhere else. You can't put everything in the cloud because you, the cloud is opaque. You never know exactly what's happening in the cloud. And so because of that, you can't trust it 100%. Well, right? Amazon is it, it, still having issues to, to right now. Like on the top of Reddit.com, yeah, Reddit it says Reddit is running in emergency read-only mode right now because Amazon is experiencing a degradation. They are working on it, but we're still waiting for them to get our volumes. You won't be able to log in. We're sorry, and the fix will fix the site as soon as possible. So you can't log in, and you can't add new stories. This kind of thing is killing them. Right. This is but no joke. There's no ads on their site right now. I mean, they're they screwed. have, at least they have this emergency read-only mode. True. Right. They True. have the ability to at least have their site up. Right. Whereas Hootsuite is just an error page. Oh, is Hootsuite still down? I think so. Uh, when I was writing the show notes for this uh, a couple hours ago, Amazon was still suffering. Yeah, Hootsuite is still down. There it is, right there. Yep. Yikes! You got to be because that these guys are sweating uh, bullets. Basically. Honestly, it reminded me of the Japanese nuclear reactor thing is Amazon's trying to fix things and they're rushing around and, and everything just keeps getting worse instead of better. Well, and unfortunately for sites like Reddit, like our chat room is saying, with sites like Reddit, it, they've just recently been able to improve their reliability because of issues with Amazon EC2, and now they're totally taken out. Uh, right. got, Alan, you're kind of in the business of this, though. This, is, this guy yeah. has to make you nervous. So there is a couple things. Uh, Basically, Amazon has these availability zones that are supposed to prevent this from happening, even inside a single data center. But maybe if you're Reddit, you should span so some of your EC2s are on the East Coast and some on the West Coast. Yeah. So and then they could still have some access right now. Of I don't know yeah. how that works with the block storage and stuff. If it's not replicated, then if East is down, you can't get the data to the West to run off it anyway. Uh, mm. Another thing is this was also causing people problems uh, starting and stopping their EC2 instances. Uh, specifically, an, a problem with stopping them can have billing implications. If you're paying a dollar an hour for your EC2 instance and you can't turn it off, then you're being billed and you can't use it. Oh, that's right. You do. You pay. You, it's like an old mainframe share thing. And the other issue. Right. That and so compounds. maybe it comes back up a little bit in a couple hours, but you're busy and you can't go shut it off now. And it runs for an extra day for no reason. The other thing, the other problem that sort of is compounded by this is Amazon, unless you're like a big, big client, Amazon doesn't have a number for you to call and say my S is down. Right. So you're kind they of have, like in that Google trap. 
Yeah, they have almost no support unless you're a huge customer paying a lot of extra money for their professional services. So the most you get is their forum where somebody might post something in reply to what you say. And they and, just had a big outage back on uh, March 17th as well. Yeah, it's, it's only been basically a month since the last time they had an EC2 failure. And this one was something that any data center can have. Uh, router f uh, partially failed, but not completely, and their failover system didn't kick in. But it seems to me that's something that any data center should have been able to deal with, and they were down for three hours because of that. Hmm. You know, it's hard to judge. Sometimes those kinds of things, when something doesn't completely go offline, are hard to detect, but boy, oh boy. Yeah. They've got to come through now and really show that... Yeah, yeah. and... I think I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure Amazon doesn't give you any kind of service level agreement. There's no SLA. So if it's down, it's like maybe they don't charge you for the hours it was down, but they don't. You Sorry get no about credit. It. Or, yeah, yeah, there's yeah. No, yeah, exactly. No credit. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Um, interesting. It's going to be an interesting story to cover. I think by the time this episode comes out, we maybe, you know, this, God, boy, I, I hope, I hope by the time this episode comes out, it doesn't turn out to be a data loss situation. Yeah, that would be ridiculous. The thing that kind of has the red flags going off in my brain is when I look at this Reddit page here and they say Reddit, uh, Reddit says uh, they're still waiting on them to get to our, we're still waiting on them to get to our volumes. It yeah. kind of implies that Amazon's working on bigger customers before them, so they're not working on Reddit yet. The yeah. other thing it could and imply is Amazon's having a hard time getting that data back. That's entirely possible. Because, uh, well, apparently what happened was they ran out of capacity in their storage system. So some storage went down, and so everything was getting, they, they make sure they maintain at least X copies of every volume. So when some volumes went down, they mirrored those to volumes that weren't holding a copy of that before. So they would maintain the minimum three or five or how many copies of each volume they have to have. And they ran out of capacity. Oh, yeah. So they couldn't, replicate it to maintain that minimum number of copies. So it's, it is possible that some blocks where all their copies went down and they'll be gone. It's possible they can get, bring those back up and they'll be accessible later once they fix the problem. But it's supposed to be highly available and it wasn't. Yeah, that's kind of its, that's kind of its thing. So, interesting to see yeah. how it goes. Do you want to shift gears? I'd love to talk about this little interesting development that happened with the whole HP uh, Gary, you know, the guy that... He said this was the yes. dude that got sm the smackdown by Sony, right? And he just donated like $10,000 to the EFF or something like that. He just did a big donation. Uh, but yeah. his story is actually a little more complicated than I initially knew. You want to share a little bit? Right, because he, he thought he had figured out some way to use Facebook and Twitter and a couple other things to track down the actual identity of people in the anonymous group. And he was, you well, know, that's being this like, guy. Oh. No, so this, yes. isn't, this, this isn't the PlayStation guy. This is the anonymous no. guy. Yes, this is the anonymous uh, hacker guy. And so he's going on about, oh, how I know where you live or whatever. And so they own his entire business. Right. They okay. uh, do some SQL injection to get... Uh, access to the user database for the CMS on their website. Uh, they just used regular MD5 hashes, so rainbow tables, and they got everybody's password. Happened to be the Funny same password often that, that access his SSH account, <laughs> and boom, they're in as the CEO of the company <laughs> on <laughs> root on a bunch of the servers. <laughs> they steal all their emails. Oh every my god! And start posting, and Yikes. so from those emails, we've learned some of the things that these guys were up to. Uh, so this H.B. Gary guy has written a bunch of books on how to write rootkits for Windows and stuff. And uh, in this particular story, he was working with a defense contractor, General Dynamics. Uh, they're the fifth largest defense contractor in the world. Uh, they used to make the F-16 fighter jets. Uh, they since sold that wing to Lockheed Martin, but anyway. Uh, in this case, uh, they had a contract through General Dynamics with the government to write uh, malware or rootkits that could surreptitiously infect a computer, um, kind of like in some movies you've seen. So somebody's at an airport or a coffee shop or whatever on their computer, and say they turn around to pick up their coffee, you stick a little device in the USB port, and now you have 
rootkitted this machine and you can access it whenever you feel like it. They've, they've also got an example here where uh, they used uh, an email attachment. They sent in an email to a guy named Phil and Rich, or two guys, and it's called alqaedadoc.rar, yep. right? And then, of course, that's like, what, that turned out to be like an Excel file with a flash vulnerability in it or something, something ridiculous. Yes, which actually, interestingly, uh, is related to our next story. Oh, really? Yeah. You know, but so, so task B was to uh, make some way that they could rootkit your server either with a physical device like USB or Firewire or PC MCIA, or they were really hoping they would be able to do it over Wi-Fi. I bet. But, uh, if you saw the movie um, Unknown with Liam Neeson, uh, in that movie, uh, they have this scientist who's invented this uh, new kind of corn or something that will feed the world. And Angelina Jolie plugs this little USB device into his laptop, and that allows them to hack into the machine and steal all the data. And then she just pulls it back out again Right. when she hands the laptop back to him. And he doesn't know that his machine has been rooted, basically. Right. This is interesting. So the HP Gary guy was selling himself as like a uh, services guy. He even has like a PowerPoint with all of his awesome experiences and whatnot. Yeah. This guy is pretty interesting. And Our so, Technic has a great write-up on this. Yes. And uh, one of the interesting things is he claimed to be able to get these root kits uh, into the machines, he had stockpiled a bunch of zero-day exploits for different software. Yeah. So he knew about security flaws in software and didn't tell the manufacturer because he wanted to save that information to use himself to His make back a bunch. pocket. Yeah. And like, we're talking like serious products like VMware yeah. ESX. Uh, he's, he, we're even talking possibly like windows server, 2003 Solaris 10 Adobe flash Java. Yeah. Um, so he has, he had exploits for all of these things just sitting on a shelf. That's, so that's his if, claim though. Yeah. This is a claim, but if he did, then shame on him for not reporting it, right? Absolutely. He's supposed to be a security professional, and he's, he's being more black hat than white hat. I have done uh, many contract security audits of IT, where I've used a lot of tools, and mm -hmm. you, do, you do walk an interesting line, actually. It's not, that's not BS. Oh. It is, you know, you are breaking into people's computer systems, and you're seeing how far you can get. And, you know, when you get into somebody's Windows box, and you put an icon on their desktop, top, desktop that says, got you, it's fun. Yeah. Um, but if you, if you're doing it as a service, as a contractor, you have a certain level of responsibility too. Yeah. So his, his idea here was to create, uh, this master rootkit tool and then sell it for a quarter million dollars a copy to anybody that would buy it, whether that's the U S government or a foreign government or a private company that wants to industrial espionage, another company or whatever. Wow. Yeah. This is interesting. I'm reading through your notes here in the show notes, you guys. You got to check this out. It's some interesting things. Yep. He got and it through Outlook, and he put it in a yeah. RAR file, so that way, hopefully, inbound scanners wouldn't be able to detect the. Well, uh, in, in that email there, he was sending a copy of what he had made to some other people to have them look at it, and that's why it was RAR and password, so they wouldn't accidentally get infected. Right. Uh, but yeah, his the task C contract that he had was to make an exploit that used the Microsoft Outlook preview pane. So that just by looking at the email, not yep. opening the attachment, it would infect the computer with a zero-day exploit. You know, uh, I am planning to do a Linux action show on Backtrack. The chat room's talking about Backtrack right now. I've used that before. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, it was Neen in the chat room who asked. Uh, and, uh, I love Backtrack, and it's a great tool. And I, <laughs> if there's an interest, let me, let me know in the comments. I'd be happy to talk about it in TechSnap, too. But, uh, yeah, uh, again, there's another tool. Um, NetExpose. It's from the people Met, that... Metasploit? Uh, yeah, NetExpose is the uh, commercial product from the oh, company no. that sponsors Metasploit. Gotcha. So it works with Metasploit, and it's basically a network vulnerability scanner. Oh, uh, Metasploit's fantastic because it includes, yeah. often what I'll do mm -hmm. is a combination of ping scans, NMAP, uh, uh, basic, you know, like if I see FTP, I just do basic, basic tricks and stuff like that. Yeah. And then you, you get Metasploit and you get Nessus, and those two things, woo-wee. Yeah. Yikes, so those are some Net power tools. Right, NetExpose is, is the scanner, and then, so it finds the vulnerabilities, and then you can, it's like, this Metasploit will let you exploit it. Oh, we should totally do an episode on, on hacking to protect yourself. I did an in-depth look on yep. it a long time ago. Because um, there's, 
it, it can, if you have administrator access, so if you're doing it on, say, your own company, yeah. if you have like a domain admin account, you yeah. can have it even log into the machines and check every piece of software that's installed and be like, hey, these machines have an outdated version of Flash that's vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And so it'll tell you that and maybe give you the Metasploit to exploit that. Yeah. And stuff. Uh, you can pay more for uh, modules that let you do your PCI compliance or uh, your cross-site scripting vulnerabilities and that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's a big business, dude. Uh, the, the, way the, yep. Nessus, the way the Nessus program works is you, uh, you subscribe, essentially, to, the, to a feed, and that mm -hmm. feed is like all of the latest vulnerabilities for OSs. Yep. And then you go through there, and you kind of just, like, as you're going, you cherry-pick the different vulnerabilities you want to try, and it goes and runs down from that feed and, and just tries to bang on a box. And, and yep. y you, can totally, you can totally crash a Windows box doing this. So you've got to be careful when you oh, use yeah. it. But. Uh, now, along the same lines of hacking and password hashes and exploits is uh, an update on the RSA Secure ID attack. Uh, this is looking worse and worse for RSA, right? Um, a bit. Uh, so the RSA Secure ID is a two-factor authentication system. It basically gives you something in addition to just your password to authenticate with. Like an ATM so, card and a PIN. Yeah, so you get a little device like I have here that gives you a number. Uh, and you that number changes every five or 10 seconds and you have to enter that along with your password. So on top of it's something you know, it's also something you have, right? It's proving you have this device and so that's two different factors authenticating you. How does that so number someone, generator work? How do they know it's the right it's number? A, it's a private and public key system oh. and so they encrypt, the, so the token has the public key and it encrypts the time with the public key and then only the private key can verify that that's, or can decrypt it. That makes to so check much that sense. The right number. I've always yeah. kind of wondered that. I figured it wasn't mm -hmm. like I've been told. If you can believe this, I've been told it's a radio transmission. No, no, <laughs> no. I knew that was BS. Because then it, it might not work in some places, right? Right, and it would have to have a battery in that thing that would be much, much, much yeah, bigger than the one. Yeah, this has a little now. watch battery that yeah. barely yeah. does anything. Um, and so, but that second factor means if someone steals your password, if they manage to sniff it or a keylogger or however they get your password. They would need this number that changes every five or 10 seconds. And so they won't be able to get into your account. Uh, and so what happened was uh, RSA itself was compromised and a bunch of data was leaked. Um, it was a, a targeted phishing attack. So what happened was somebody sent uh, a batch of emails to a bunch of people at RSA that included an Excel file that exploited a zero day flash exploit. So somebody found a hole in Flash, and instead of reporting it to Adobe, they used it, uh, stuck it in an Excel doc, and emailed it to a bunch of people. Oh, my gosh. So and um, that at least one employee at RSA uh, went into their spam folder, pulled this out of it, and opened it. Well, can, can I just say, Microsoft, what the hell? Why does Excel support embedding? It's because it's a web object, and Excel supports yep. embedding web objects. That's stupid. Yeah. So, so... You not only do you rely on a little bit of social engineering there to get somebody to open that attachment, but mm -hmm. then you rely on a vulnerability in a third-party piece of software. But because that third-party piece of software is so prevalent, mm -hmm. you're almost guaranteed it's going to work. Yeah, and in this case, it's you're targeting one specific company, so they right. probably have it on every computer, or they don't, right? So yeah. it makes it a little easier than a general phishing attack. Yeah, um, IT organization sometimes does have that downside. Yeah. And uh, well, the interesting part is that it went to their spam folder, right? They detected that this was junk mail. Most likely it's because they, they forged the from header to say it was from somebody at RSA. And, this, and, and, and that didn't match yeah. the sender policy framework. Right, right. Anyway, so it goes into the spam folder, but somebody pulls it out of there anyway and opens it and gets infected. Uh, <laughs> so they use the Poison Ivy remote administration tool. And so they compromised that one machine, and then from there, they progged all over the place. And now they own the RSA network, the internal uh, RSA they did. network. And so they, they did. Uh, used privilege escalation attacks and credentials they managed to sniff and key loggers and all that different things they could do uh, to get at some sensitive data. Then they moved that to one of the RSA's uh, staging servers. It's like a test website kind of thing where they sure. test their software and put it, they put it out. Right. Uh, then from there, they used a compromised dedicated server at some hosting provider to FTP in and copy out all the data they stole. 
and then they erase the data attack. But then they erase the data they stole from RSA's staging server and from the server they hacked. So the RSA isn't one hundred percent sure exactly what was stolen. <sighs> oh, mm-hmm. <laughs> that sucks. So wow. they've issued a bunch of instructions on things people should do to to try to uh, mitigate and prepare. The, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just could they, basically because of the way the system is designed, they shouldn't be able to just use this to break anybody's stuff but they might have got enough information where they could social engineer people into giving away the rest of the information here's uh do you want to hear rsa's public announce a uh, public statement on this they sure. say our investigation has led us to believe that the attack is in the category of advanced persistent threat as in maybe they still think they could get in our investigation has also revealed the attack resulted in certain information being extracted from rsa's system some of that information specifically related to rsa's Secure ID two factor authentication products. Yeah, wow. they're being very vague and they use the phrase I believe or we believe yeah. or we think a bunch of times because they're not sure. We have no evidence that customer security related to other than our RSA products has been impacted because they're also, you know, they have no agency. evidence, but that doesn't mean that it didn't happen. Holy they sorry. just haven't found any evidence of that yet. Well, let's hope that whatever information they got that RSA was following best practices and that information was encrypted. Right? Yeah. But once they're, they, they might have got the credentials for that encryption by, through the series of machines they compromised and, and people they compromised at the company. Wow. So it's hard to say. It is hard to say, yeah, because you don't, they, well, they called it an advanced persistent threat, which seems to me to imply right. that they're not sure the threat's completely gone. Well, it's, it's more that it's someone spent a lot of time and effort going after them specifically, as opposed to regular phishing where you just, blanket everybody you can and hope well, you yeah, dude, they're RSA. Of course that's going to happen. You have to expect that. Exactly. As, yeah, and you, you expect that. They, they try to address that when in the opening of their public statement. It's like, as with every day, we rejected, a, we rebuffed a bunch of attacks, but one happened to get through. <laughs> oh, please. Kind of thing. What a bunch of, way to take the high ground there, guys. Mm-hmm. A little sore. Uh, just a kind of, a couple of follow-up stories you wanted to cover before we wrap this uh, second episode of TechSnap up. Yeah, um, um we talked a bit about the Facebook data center design stuff. I think we uh, both kind of walked away fairly impressed by uh, Facebook's open data center initiative. Yeah, but uh, I remember when we talked about it, we weren't exactly sure how they did the cooling. Right. Right, because they had a, a lot fewer fans in each of the individual machines. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, they've released some uh, videos and pictures of, of what it oh. actually looks like and how it works. Oh, okay. So they have some uh, nice diagrams of how they actually do the cooling. Oh, yeah, check this out. So uh, over at uh, Sla- uh, Slashdot has a... Uh, oh Yeah, but it's from, uh, I think, datacenterknowledge.com yeah. has yeah, the actual stuff. That's pretty cool. Okay. Yeah. So and they have some uh, neat stuff. They have... Uh, so they, one of the things I know they, they mentioned was uh, the fact that uh, they use larger fans, too. Yeah. Which is interesting. It's an interesting approach because you move more air, so... Yeah, so they, they basically their philosophy seems to be to one big set of chillers to cool the entire rack at once instead of a whole bunch of small fans in each individual machine. And that works if you're Facebook and you're going to fill a whole bunch of racks with all your own machines. A building practically, yeah. Yeah. Uh, where if you're a typical company, you're going to buy a couple servers at a time, that, that approach probably wouldn't work for you. This is funny. So this uh, video is great because they have, uh, they have huge like air filters that they have on the mm-hmm. walls to get the, the air has to pass through, which is kind of awesome. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you'd have to have a data center built for this. Yeah, like you would have to be having more than just a couple of servers of your that own makes to, sense. to bother with this. And just like anything else, you, could, you can pick and choose what information you want to use and what information you know, you're not, you're not going to implement. Yeah, and it was interesting uh, you were saying about the air filters. I remember I had uh, the first server I ever co-located. Uh, eventually, I called it back home after a couple of years. And I remember when I opened it up, I was surprised the fact there was absolutely no dust inside the thing. Ah. And it, they hadn't, like, opened it or cleaned it or anything. It was just, they had HEPA filters and everything, so there was just no dust in the data center. Huh. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Especially since, uh, especially in data centers, they have smoke detectors that if they see a lot of particles like dust, they might set off this fire alarm. So they make an effort to keep the dust down. Um, I love this. I remember it had diagrams more have. dust in it uh, after a week at my house than it did two years at the oh. data center. Oh, <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, you know, uh, the uh, so on the opposite side of that, uh, I worked for a large independent Washington State financial uh, uh, company, and um, they had a portion of their data center in uh, some servers were in one area of the data center, which was walled off, and then there was another much larger data center where the mainframe was, the big System 390 mainframe, and that shared space with the check printers. And we would literally have to go in about once every few months and uh, wipe down the servers. They'd have like almost like snow powder on them, like yep. inside and everything. It just got all over mm-hmm. everything. Uh, another follow-up story, Alan. Let's talk about uh, the Dropbox story. That yeah. was kind of an interesting one from last week. Yeah, so there was uh, more follow-up and talk about exactly who has access to your data once you put it in Dropbox. Right. Uh, originally, their statement on their website made it sound or almost specifically said that uh, it was impossible for their employees to access your data, right? They could see metadata like file names, but they couldn't access your actual data. Mm -hmm. Uh, But now they've changed it that instead they have a policy that prohibits employees (laughs) from looking at your files. Right. Oh, that's good. uh, Well, so before, before they made it sound like each user had a private key that was used for the AES and the files were like encrypted before they left your computer right. so that Dropbox wouldn't have access to your files. Right. But now it turns out that they only encrypt with their own key, like we were saying last week. So they have one key that they use for everybody's files. And then they have a and policy in place which prevents anybody from decrypting those unless there's a good reason to. Yeah. But that doesn't, you know, even Google's had problems with employees going yeah. beyond what they're supposed to be doing. Yeah. Right. There was a story about someone and getting to a celebrity's Gmail account not too long ago. Yep. Or having inappropriate conversations with little kids as well. There was one of those. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. There's, you know, this kind of stuff happens, especially in a big company. Here's so the, this is a, and the other thing is Dropbox is a small startup. They're probably less strict about policies than a lot of other companies that does tend to be we don't know but that does tend to be the case um i yeah. you know i haven't stopped using dropbox i'm just conscious of what i put in there yeah um because it's still a great value and service and mm-hmm. it offers a lot of features that uh you know honestly that that the ability for them to decrypt and compare information and is is a value add you know if i drop something in there that's already up on the dropbox system why not save me save you all the bandwidth in yeah. the time yeah so there is that element it's just you know i have to keep aware of what i put in there but and it, it basically negates the value of encrypting it if everything's just encrypted with the one same key. Right. And we should, well, we should mention, too, and Dropbox uh, restated this, that all of the data is transmitted in SSL, so it's encrypted as it right. goes to Dropbox. And right. they've, they sit so, on the Dropbox hard drives encrypted. Mm-hmm. But Dropbox has the keys for that, yeah. and they will decrypt stuff if they get a good enough reason to do so. But if hopefully, and we don't know Mm -hmm. how their security structure is, but if the data sits on their servers or on S3, as the case probably is uh, Mm -hmm. encrypted, if somebody compromised the Dropbox back end, just getting to the data wouldn't get them the information. They'd also have to be able to get that key. But depending how they structure it, that key is probably has to be in their software somewhere to encrypt the data to the store. Right. And so if that key is, is not isolated enough from whatever gets broken into, then they have the key and they have access to all the files. Yeah. It's, but I'm more worried, honestly, about an employee at Dropbox that decides they want to read somebody's files. Right, absolutely. That's, mm-hmm. that's always going to be your biggest uh, or threat is the internal you employee. You get the, the, the advanced persistent threat like RSA. Somebody emails somebody at Dropbox, they open an attachment, and their computer gets compromised, somebody gets the keys and decrypts everybody's Dropbox files. If Dropbox feels that this sort of one key system is critical to how their service operates, then they are fundamentally compelled by that decision to structure their business in a way that, that treasures that secret key like it's the Coca-Cola recipe. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like it, it needs to be taken more seriously than the Coca-Cola recipe, in my opinion. Yeah. Because their whole entire business model completely falls apart when I can no longer trust them at all. As soon as I think somebody's screwing around in there, well, that, mm-hmm. they're dead, right? Yeah, because somebody will come out with a different service that's the same idea. Freaky stuff. Well, I'd like to hear, I'd like to hear comments, too, on this if people are, if people are thinking about yeah. switching. I'll have to add a link to the show notes, but I... I talked about something similar to what they could do to solve this. Uh, a couple of years ago when the U.S. Secret Service, uh, some contractor was using a computer inside their network and installed uh, some file sharing software, 
and a bunch of information got leaked out over file sharing. Yeah, right? that's it right. Because defaults to sharing like the whole folder structure. And they leaked out uh, motorcade routes and the location of undisclosed safe houses. Oh, no. Yeah. And so what I talked about was, obviously, they need to encrypt that data. But they need more than that, right? Uh, if you're saying the motorcade route, if, if for, say, some Secret Service agent is turned and is working for the enemy or bribed Ooh. or whatever, yeah, right? You want not only does the data need to be encrypted, but it has to be like cryptographically signed to say who changed it, right? Because otherwise, sure, they don't give the uh, the motorcade route to the bad guys, but they change the motorcade route to drive by a place where the bad guys can set up a better ambush. Right. You got so you want to you want to be able to validate the data. Right. So, and the other idea was using uh, shared secret keys. So in some way that it would take, say, three people would have to work, like, be together. It's like, you know, the missile keys in a submarine, right? You need yeah. two or three keys turned at once to unlock the data. Or co-op and portal. You need two people to yeah. open the door. Yeah, or an STF and Stowe or whatever. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. so, but the, the idea that this way one rogue employee can't get access to the Dropbox key. Right. right, you would need three people turning the key simultaneously to get access to the treasure. And let's just say, a worst case scenario is, I mean, absolute worst case scenario, in my opinion, is that the key is integrated into some sort of administrative platform that you just simply have access to this admin yeah. panel or admin software, and the keys baked right in. Which is protected right by a simple password, or some sort of login and, rights. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that would be worst case in my opinion, and and yeah. also likely. <laughs> but. I think the moral of the story here is that you can't take the company's word for it when they say that their app or service is secure. They need to ex give you details on what they're doing to make it secure and maybe hopefully even be audited by some external people that you can trust have actually done a good job. There's of the lots of companies out there that offer auditing. I used to do it. There's companies out there that offer auditing yeah. services. But there's a lot that will kind of rubber stamp it, too. Oh, yeah. No, you get, yeah, that's the thing. Like the, uh, uh, the McAfee hacker safe one is worthless. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, like, yeah. I, I've had customers that use it. And when they find a problem, you have 30 days before they'll take the little icon off your website. So you can sit there vulnerable for 30 days, and th their logo will just say your site is hacker safe. And when, you're high, when they like decertify you, the logo is just invisible. So it's not saying this site is insecure. You put like a transparent PNG in its place or something? Yeah, it's just, yeah there's just nothing there. <laughs> Adorable. But, um, and, and basically the checking is, is horribly rudimentary and completely automated. Yeah. And they charge you like a couple thousand dollars for it too. And it's, it's, and they, yeah, and they're just selling it on their name, which is in my opinion, yeah. not that much. Um, Alan, we should probably call it at this mark right here. I, we've I got so, way yeah. more show. We've got way more show yeah. on the docs. Uh, so people check but, out the uh, show notes. I mean, Alan <laughs> did an incredible job on those. Um, and I think we wanted to make mention just to be aware of the tech snap isn't always going to be completely security focused, although I often will be because that is a fascinating mm -hmm. area to discuss. Uh, but we, we, we intend to cover an entire range of technology and we try to throw in some stories like the Dropbox and Amazon stuff. And, yeah. um, so that's, that's just, this is just the beginning and we want to hear your feedback and a great way to sort of impact the show is engage with us on our Facebook page over at facebook.com slash tech snap. Yep, and or the uh, comments on the show page. Yeah, or, and again, you can find the RSS feeds and grab this show as we release them. Right <laughs> now, the in plan, the schedule, the clear, it's been cleared off Mondays, and I think it's going to try to be Monday mornings, and of course I'm on the Pacific Coast, but Monday mornings over at jupiterbroadcasting.com will be the released on-demand version of this show where you can get it in all the various feeds and whatnot. Yeah? Mm -hmm. All right, Alan, I think that wraps us up for this episode. I think so. Okay, everyone. Well, thanks for watching the second episode of TechSnap. See you next week. 